Okay. Dr. Hayes, how are you doing? Very well, Dr. Kerwin. How are you? Doing very well. Okay. Okay. We've stopped sharing. Uh, Adele and Karina, good evening. How are you guys doing? Doing well. Thank you, Doctor. Hi, Dr. Hayes. Good evening. Our intrepid graduate assistants donating formidable chunks of their summer, Dr. Hayes, <laughs> to help with our little project here. Adele, how are we doing here? Okay, so I think we're good to go. I think we are, we are, uh, I just checked. Are we, Karina and Adele, are we, um, li we're live on Facebook and YouTube, that's correct, right? You're live in YouTube. Great. Okay. I believe we are live on Facebook. Make sure all our feeds. There we go. Okay. Good. Okay. All right, Dr. Hayes. You're good to go, Dr. Hayes. Uh, I'm I'm ready when you are. Your your camera is off to the side. Just so you know. I'm not sure if that's. There you go. Okay. Okay. All right, we're recording. <clears throat> okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to our online summer theology series sponsored by the University of St. Thomas in Houston. We have a very special lecture for you tonight. And there's a, a quite a distinction to this, to our only lecture tonight. Well, actually, no, I have to take that back because depends on how we classify Irenaeus. Um, but um, as you, as many of you know, you've been tuning in week, week, week after week, and we are uh, so grateful for your attendance in this um, long lecture series. We began on May 12th with the Cardinal, De, with Cardinal DiNardo. We had Bishop Lopes on. We have, we've been going week after week. And after uh, tonight, we only have two more weeks. Next week, we have Sister Alba Marie Sermansky, Dominican sister here at UST on uh, Albert the Great and Eucharistic Beauty. And then we finish up with um, Dr. Aquila on uh, Newman on Development of Doctrine, which is quite a fitting way to finish up. So um, we've been going through this and, and what we've been highlighting week after week is that this is just simply what we do. This is our specialty here at the University of St. Thomas is being deep in tradition. And we, take, we, we relish leading students through the tradition, taking them through the, the primary text and, and the great texts of the tradition. So I've been getting, a, uh, there's been quite a feedback from the, we've had our views and the interest in the series has exceeded expectations. And so you know, I'm still getting uh, inquiries about the program. It's not too late if you're interested and you want to go deep in the tradition and do an MA in, in theology or an MA in philosophy and theology. Uh, feel free to shoot us an email or contact us and we can tell you everything you need to know. Um, why don't we open with prayer and then I will introduce tonight's guest. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, tonight, before I introduce our speaker, let me just run through the drill, which you already know now. Feel free to, uh, we'll have a Q&A after we're all done, and feel free to send your comments in in the Zoom chat box, or if you're watching on Facebook, feel free to throw them into the, the thread under the stream. We'll see them there as well. Or if you're on YouTube, I know some, we have some, some watch parties that sometimes some young adult watch parties that have been local to the Houston area that have been uh, following along. You can ask questions that way as well. And so that we, we can try to cover everything after the talk. Okay. So uh, tonight I would, I'm, I'm particularly delighted to introduce 
Dr. Andrew Hayes. Dr. Hayes is a tenured associate professor of theology here at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, and he's the division dean of liberal studies. He has a foot both in academia and in administration. Dr. Hayes conducts research on Syriac patristics and on related theological and literary traditions. Syriac, a dialect of the Aramaic language, serves as the vehicle for a major tradition of Christian literature and culture in the Near East from the early period until today. He specializes particularly in asceticism, spirituality, and theological poetics in the thought of St. Ephraim, the Syrian, 4th century. Other areas where he has published or presented research include early Syriac authors, Jacob of Seru, Philoxenus of uh, Mabu, both fifth and sixth centuries. His other, he, he other, also specializes in Oriental Christian language, Syriac and Arabic, early Christian spirituality and monasticism, theological poetics, history of Christian Muslim relations, relationship between Syriac Christian literature and the Quran. And don't let him fool you. You're thinking he does an awful lot of patristics, which he does. He knows quite a bit about the modern era as well. He's read a lot of uh, he's read a lot of Newman and, and figures like that. Dr. Hayes, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks so much for making time for us. We're really excited to hear what you have to say about Saint Ephraim tonight. It's truly a delight to be uh, here with you all, uh, Dr. Kerwin, and especially to be able to talk about Saint Ephraim, who is, um, of course, my my favorite subject uh, of all. So. I'm really uh, looking forward to being able to give this lecture and, and to hear people's questions. <clears throat> um, I uh, do have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to put that up so that everyone can follow along with the quotations that I'm going to be using. So you'll bear with me for a second. I will put that up on the screen. All right, that looks like that's the way it should be. And so without further ado, we will uh, we'll begin. So St. Ephraim the Syrian is perhaps the most mellifluous of the voices of the ancient church. Like other early saints whom the church reveres as her fathers and teachers, he is striking for the clarity and insight of his theological teaching and for the ardor with which he used the faith of the apostles, like, as he put it, a key to unlock the treasuries of the sacred scriptures for the faithful. He is easily the equal of the great Athanasius, whose contemporary he was, but unlike Athanasius and many of the other fathers, whose names are better known in our times, Ephraim wrote in Aramaic, and such was his command of the language of the first Christians that he composed a multitude of poems whose beauty his successors could never quite match. Between four and 500 of these theological poems, which are called in uh, Aramaic madrashe, have survived down to our time. And a madrasha is, uh, in more technical terms, a stanzaic poem with a refrain. So you'll have a series of stanzas, each punctuated by a, a refrain. And, uh, and the madrashe can vary in length. You're going to see many examples of them in, in tonight's talk. Parts of these madrashe are still used in the liturgical prayers of the Aramaic speaking churches, and they have profoundly influenced the theological hymnody of the Byzantine Greek tradition. Several metrical discourses and prose works, including biblical commentaries, also survive, and you'll be seeing some examples, some quotations from those works as well this evening. I want to start with the word madrasha itself. It comes from the Aramaic root for instruction, and this means that uh, it, it also has exegetical connotations, so you might compare the Hebrew word midrash, that is cognate with the Aramaic word madrasha. So Ephraim composed his madrashe, we can safely assume, to teach, or in other words, to impart to those who heard them the knowledge of God. And in fact, he made the knowledge of God, he made that, uh, that topic an explicit theme in much of his teaching. Ephraim regarded the human person as in fact made for the knowledge of God, made to know God. And in fact, in his terms, the entire story of salvation 
can even be cast in dramatic terms of how that knowledge goes wrong and how it goes right. And by the way, when the knowledge of God goes right, that's what we call orthodoxy. Tonight, therefore, my goal is to explore with you Ephraim's paradoxical teaching that we, with our created perception and intelligence, are created to put into practice a knowledge of the God who, as St. John Chrysostom later put it, quote, is beyond description, beyond understanding, invisible, incomprehensible, always existing, and always the same. So, to achieve this goal, uh, I'm going to, after I give you a few brief notes on Ephraim's life and homeland, I'm going to focus on this whole concept that we are made to know God, and I'm going to do it in three parts. We're going to start with Moses and go to Adam and discuss the biblical paradigm, according to Ephraim, for knowing God. And then we're going to consider how we might actually live out that paradigm and practice the perception of God. And lastly, we'll touch upon this question of whether God can be investigated by, uh, by human intelligence. So let's start with a few remarks about Ephraim's life and importance and his homeland. Though he is called the Syrian, this should not lead us to think that St. Ephraim is from modern-day Syria. Instead, the, the word refers much more broadly to the Syrian Orient. You can see it here on the map. Um, a, uh, it, this is the homeland of Aramaic or Syriac-speaking Christianity, which stretches roughly from Antioch east through the Fertile Crescent to the Persian Gulf. And the Syriac dialect of Aramaic uh, comes particularly from the city of Edessa, also called in Syriac or Hoy or or Hai, depending on your pronunciation tradition. Uh, Ephraim himself, however, was not from this city, but from another city further east, um, an ancient city called Nisibis, which sat on a tributary of the mighty Euphrates on the border between Rome and Persia along the Silk Route. And there he served his bishops as a deacon, a teacher, and a liturgical composer until forced by war to flee in the year 363 to Edessa. Here is an image of him represented in the traditional Syrian style serving as a deacon. You can see him there with his orarian, what in the Western church is called the stole, and holding the censer, which is the, the um, uh, badge of office of the deacon. <clears throat> now, Ephraim, as you can tell from looking at the map a moment ago, lived in close geographical and cultural proximity to the Jewish communities of Mesopotamia. Hence, one feature that gives Ephraim's writings a great deal of their theological interest is their intimate familiarity with Jewish exegetical tradition and their intensely biblical idiom. Ephraim inhabits the culture of the Bible, you might say, as a native. And this becomes especially evident in his exegesis of the narratives about Moses and Adam. And I wanna highlight one other key feature of his thought also, his principled embrace of wonder. He explicitly rejects an approach to God that would reduce God to concepts and propositions. And in this way, his thought also serves as an important antidote to uh, modern rationalism. Ironically, the rationalistic and pragmatistic tendencies that still linger in our own culture can sometimes make it difficult for contemporary Christians to appreciate the importance and significance of the church's traditional teaching that the human being is made to know God. For those who incline towards a more pragmatic view, knowledge serves, uh, seems to serve simply as a means to some other goal and not as a goal in itself. And then as for the rationalists, because they tend to reduce every intellectual act to thinking, uh, that in its turn tends to reduce heaven to mere syllogisms, not something that many people find attractive. Ephraim's view is completely different. One might describe it as sapiential, because for him, the knowledge of God is wisdom, a transformative experience of God as different from other knowledge as the sun differs from the things that it illuminates. This wisdom, when experienced, at least as Ephraim presents it, 
um, shapes every level of the person. It shapes the perceptions, the thoughts, and the actions. And by embracing it, we shape ourselves. To understand something about the role and importance of knowing God in human life, we're going to follow Ephraim's thought from Moses to Adam. And I'd like you to consider the following vivid description, which I've put up for you uh, on the screen. This description takes its starting point from Moses' fasting on Sinai when he went up to speak with God and receive the Torah. If you are still hungry for more, St. Ephraim says, Moses will restrain you, for he took no provisions when he ascended to the mountain summit. He became all the more fat in his hunger and all the more beautiful in his thirst. Who has ever seen a man in his hunger eat a vision and grow beautiful, drink a voice and become fat? On the very glory, he fattened, grew, and was transfigured. Now, we in order to understand this, we have to recall that Moses ascended Mount Sinai. The Jews were left, the Israelites were left at the base of the, of the mountain, right? He ascended, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So you would expect him, when he comes down from the mountain, to descend, you expect him to descend from the mountain gaunt and pale. But no, he comes to the Israelites, shining with a brightness so unbearable that they fear to behold him. And so Ephraim sees this as the very vision of God nourishing the human being. And in this case, you become what you eat or you reflect what you see. This is the reason that elsewhere, Ephraim explicitly states that Moses has become what he beheld. He puts it this way. Moses, who was made radiant, became greater than he was by the blood he who had become a god triumphed via his staff. So in context, what's Ephraim talking about? He's talking about the, the Exodus. He's talking about the staff of Moses and the blood of the Paschal Lamb. And he sees those as the foreshadowing symbols of the Son of God. But Moses' paradoxical becoming like God without being God <clears throat> provides Ephraim with evidence for another one of his most important and thematic contentions that the divine essence is available to us and yet it is incomprehensible to the mind. So Ephraim uses this example of Moses becoming like God without being God and this example of him shining as he comes down from the mountain to, uh, as, a, as, a, as a form of biblical argument. If the Israelite people could not look on Moses, though he was human, who is able to gaze upon the divine essence? So notice that for Ephraim, Moses, as a symbol and mirror of the divine glory, paradoxically inhabits this sort of in-between state. He's two things at once. He is, on the one hand, an icon of the glorious and intimate knowledge of God and a symbol of its incomprehensibility, on the other hand, to creatures. So in the state of transfigured knowledge of God, he is both a mirror and a veil. Elsewhere, Ephraim develops this paradox even more extensively. Speaking of the only begotten word of God, he says, while he, that now we're talking about the son of God, while he is completely hidden, his nature is both known and unknown. On the one hand, it is clear that he exists. On the other, how he is, is hidden. Let us forego that which goes beyond us, but let us hold fast to what he has entrusted to us. And what is his example for this? So he's, try, he's just explained how the Son of God is both hidden and revealed at the same time. So we can't know his essence, but we can know something about him. His example for this is Moses. What iconographer can fix his gaze upon that brightness, that brightness with which Moses was arrayed? For they could not adequately represent him, neither the painters of walls nor the dyers of garments. In other words, there's no, this was an undepictable image, right? This experience which Moses had. Moses, it, notice the parallel, just like the word of God, the son of God, is both knowable and unknowable. Perceptible, yes, but indescribable. Moses's brightness cannot be adequately represented. 
And in the same way, the nature of the existing one cannot be comprehensively seen. You see that parallel there? Indeed, he says, the heavenly colors of that radiance cannot be perfectly grasped by either the eye or the mind, right? So it's not just a matter of the eye not being capable of it, the mind is not capable of grasping this radiance. Right? So what's, what's that from doing here? He, he's making clear that Moses' overpowering brightness that he experienced on Sinai when he went up to speak with God, and then he came down from Sinai shining like the sun, that overpowering brightness is an outer symbol of an inner transcendence. The divine essence is ultimately ungraspable by our concepts. It's not just a matter of overpowering our mortal sight, although that does happen, but of a nature who the mode of whose existence is in itself incomprehensible. The divine nature is like that, right? And the, the incomprehensibility of the divine essence, it's important to point out, you might think, okay, this is, this is interesting. Where is he getting this from? It's in the Torah itself. No man can see me and live, God says. And this is in Exodus 33, 20. No man can see me and live. This is the thing that, that Ephraim is, is, is focusing his attention on, right? As Ephraim ponders this statement, in its context, he realizes something then. What does this say about, about what happened to Moses? Well, he says, it, it seems to suggest that that essence, which is unmade and uncreated, this, that's the divine essence, eyes which are made and created are unable to see. And yet, yet, this is a matter of God's love for us, not of his anger, because he all, Ephraim also knows that God did not completely withhold from Moses the vision of himself. And so, Ephraim says, the being whose sight is lethal to its viewers that's God, right? Is lethal not because of his harsh anger, but because of his overpowering radiance. Thus, a paradoxical compromise is reached. There's a sort of in-between state in which human createdness draws near to God without usurping God's mode of being. So here is his complete description. Having pondered these things, he puts it like this. For this reason, he who in his manifold love gave to Moses the chance to see his glory, also by his manifold love, prevented him from seeing his glory. Not because something of the glory of the majesty was diminished, but rather that weak eyes were unequal to the violent torrents of his active glory. And for this reason, the God who in his love willed that the sight of Moses be placed within the pleasant splendor of his glory did not will in his love that the sight of Moses be drowned amidst the overpowering rays of his active glory. And so Moses saw and did not see. He saw that he might grow and he did not see that he might not be injured by that which he saw. By that which he did see, his littleness grew majestic. And by that which he did not see, his weakness was not drowned. One of the interesting features of this is that um, Ephraim uses this word teshbachta, which is slightly different. It's the same root as the word for glory, but it's actually a verbal noun. So I've translated it here as active glory. It's almost like the glory of God as alive as and as vivifying, but in this case, it's also paradoxically uh, <laughs> deadly to those who behold it at full strength, right? So recall too that this entire incident, this is Moses up on Sinai. Well, why is he on Sinai in the first place? Well, it's to receive the Torah. This is the moment in the Torah itself where the revelation of the Torah is described, right? And so the, the Torah itself in recounting this story is teaching us something about the nature of that revelation. The knowledge of God that we've been given is indeed a light for us, one that elevates us. But one of the things that it shows us also it, it reinforces our grasp that the creator cannot be grasped by his creatures. It's not as if our sight somehow takes in the divine glory. Rather, as you notice in the description of Moses, 
it is positioned within and surrounded by the divine radiance. This is how Ephraim understands human knowing and speaking of the incomprehensible God, not as taking something into us so much as being taken into something greater than ourselves. So this is Moses' experience that Ephraim uh, refers to when he thinks about what it means to know God. In fact, the human person, Ephraim thinks, was in the beginning made for the knowledge of God just described. And when Ephraim explains this, he actually turns to Adam and Eve. He presents Adam and Eve's creation in terms that remind one of Moses. Actually, though, the shoe is on the other foot. It's the other way around. All along, Ephraim has been describing Moses in Adamic terms, in terms like Adam. And in these accounts of Adam, we also are going to discover that Ephraim gives the name of wisdom to this experience which Moses had. He doesn't call it that in the story of Moses, but when we turn to how he describes it in the case of Adam, he gives it the name of wisdom. So what was Adam's vocation to wisdom? Well, to understand that, we need to turn to uh, Ephraim's commentary on Genesis. And here we find him following Jewish tradition in talking about Adam clothed in divine glory. Ephraim simply says, God clothed Adam in glory, imparted to him reason and thought, and put him in a state of perceiving the majesty of God. And you see that all these three things go together. In this brief remark, we've got, we've got three features, two of which we've already seen in reference to Moses, right? Being clothed in divine glory, glory as a garment, and also that perception of the divine majesty. But in addition to those two elements, the clothing of, with glory and the perception of the divine majesty, Ephraim explicitly notes here that God gave Adam reason and thought which distinguish him from the other animals. And that feature, it turns out, was implicit in the story of Moses too. And we can see this in a, a little bit later in the commentary on Genesis when Ephraim says that Adam was wiser than all the animals and more skilled than, than them all. Just as Israel could not look upon the face of Moses apart from the veil, so also the animals were unable to look upon the radiance of Adam's presence. So right there you see Ephraim explicitly comparing the two stories, making that link between Adam and Moses. And one of the crucial things we have to realize about Ephraim's explanation of the uh, experience of Adam and Eve is uh, his view that God's plan all along was that Adam and Eve would grow. And remember that we now we now that we hear that word grow, we can actually recall that all those passages with Moses talking about Moses being in the glory of God, all almost all of them use that language of growing, getting bigger, right? Same thing here with with Adam and Eve. Um, the the goal according to Ephraim for Adam and Eve was that they would grow in divine wisdom. So God's initial prohibition against the, the tree of knowledge, he tells Adam and Eve not to touch the tree of knowledge, it was not permanent. It was not a permanent command, according to Ephraim. It was a period of training for Adam. If Adam had been successful, Ephraim says, in his period of fasting, and here we might also remember what was Moses doing on Sinai, he was fasting, right? Um, it, if, if Adam had been successful in that period of fasting which was imposed upon him and he had matured, then Ephraim says he would have eaten from the one tree and lived, that's the tree of life, and he would have eaten from the other and had knowledge. He would have eaten from the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Life that is free of the possibility of injury, so immortal life, and wisdom free of confusion. So Ephraim's remarks on this point in particular also show that he does not think of wisdom solely in terms of the passive reception of a divine illumination. It's not just that God zaps you and suddenly you're wise. It's more complicated than that. Actually, uh, wisdom, according to Ephraim, unfolds in the form of an active human response to God's gracious gift. Here's how he explains it. God situated two trees in paradise a tree of life, and another of wisdom. A pair of blessed wellsprings of every good thing. Notice that the two trees, both of them, are good, right? Because everything God makes is good. 
and it was good for us. In these two glorious realities, Ephraim says, a person can become the likeness of God via life without death and wisdom without error. But then he goes on to say this, that the outer knowledge which God gave to him, by which he called Eve and the animals by their names, did not reveal to him the discoveries of hidden things. Rather, he was capable of comprehending that concealed knowledge from the celestial bodies downward, that is, the investigating of all things that exist within the world. So Ephraim envisions here a harmonious cooperation between two levels of knowledge. Some of it comes by God's sheer gift, but some of it by our investigation in response, and it finds its crown in wisdom. Now, in his commentary on Genesis, Ephraim links this transfiguring experience of wisdom more explicitly to becoming like God. They would have acquired, he says, divinity with their humanity. And if they had acquired infallible knowledge and immortal life, they would have possessed them in those same bodies. In other words, this likeness to God, which God intended for us, which comes about through wisdom and immortality, is not just something for the afterlife. They were supposed to have it now, in this life, and yet they were impatient. And so now we're in a position to answer the question, what, what is this wisdom that Ephraim's talking about? It, it, we've, now that we've seen some examples of it, it's, it's clear that the comparison between Adam and Eve shows us, in the first place, we're talking about knowledge or perception of God, right? But as the quotation we just looked at a moment ago pointed out also, in a derivative fashion, this wisdom extends to everything in the created world, which, and here's the key part, which thus comes to be viewed differently. It, becomes to, it comes to be viewed in a divine light as filled with symbols everywhere reflecting the divine glory. So as far as God is concerned, this wisdom is not principally propositional information about him, not, not primarily that, but rather the experience of his light. And the reason for this was made clear in Ephraim's exegesis of Moses. The creator transcends creaturely concepts, and every created symbol that might mediate him to us truly can never do so completely. God is thus perilously available to the human mind. Adam experienced that peril when he failed to approach the tree of knowledge in due time and with due measure, and thus even what he had was taken away. Moses, by contrast, approaches with fasting and with measure, and thus what Adam lost was restored to him. Now, <clears throat> one might object at this point, okay, that, that's perhaps an interesting exegesis, but how can an ordinary Christian experience or, or expect that same transformative experience of the vision of God? Is that something that's even possible for us in this life? Because even if we long to know God, we cannot surely be all be Moses on Sinai, or, or so it seems. But actually, Ephraim does think, he does think, that God graciously and perilously makes himself available to us, not just to Moses, not just to Adam, but to us. And he does so in a threefold stream of symbols, symbols of nature, symbols of scripture, and symbols of in the church. And with their help, we must develop an eye transfigured, an eye luminous enough to see them for what they really are. Now, what's interesting about this is speaking of these symbols that we find in nature, symbols that we find in scripture, symbols that we find in the church. It's easy for Ephraim to speak this way because the word in Syriac for symbols and types in nature and scripture, namely the word raze in the singular raza, it's the exact same word as the word for sacraments. That is to say, the liturgical holy mysteries of the church. And so his language thus transitions seamlessly from the contemplation of the world around us to inhabiting the world of scripture through Lectio Divina, spiritual reading, to resting in the eternal day of the church's liturgical worship. 
And the radiance of paradise, the dwelling place of God with mortals, is thus available to us, where? In the church. Father Sidney Griffith has this lovely way of putting it. He says, for Ephraim, biblical typologies are indeed raze, symbols. But so are many things in nature and also in the apostolic kerygma and the life of the church, like sacraments. For him, the Raze all point to the incarnate Christ, who is the Lord of all the Raze, who fulfills all the Raze in his crucifixion. So they may point forward from nature and scripture to Christ, who in turn reveals the Father to the eye of faith, or they may point from the church's life and liturgy back to Christ, who in turn reveals to the faithful believer the events of the eschaton, the ultimate fulfillment of all creation in the economy of salvation. One of the best examples of this symbolic dynamic that Father Sidney just described between the Old Testament and the life of the church and transfiguration occurs in Ephraim's sixth hymn on paradise, which I'm going to quote at some length. So I encourage you to let this one sort of wash over you. Take it one stanza at a time. God planted the fair garden. He built the, the pure church. In the tree of knowledge, he established a commandment he offered joy, but they did not respond with delight. He warned, but they did not heed. In the midst of the church, he fixed the word. He brings joy by his promises and fear by his threats. He who despises him perishes, but the one admonished by him lives. The assembly of the saints is like a type of paradise the fruit that gives life to all, in it is plucked daily. In it is pressed, my brethren, the cluster that gives life to all. The serpent is maimed and bound by the curse, but Eve's mouth is sealed with a helpful silence, even as her mouth becomes a harp to the praise of her creator. And Ephraim continues, No one among them is naked, for they have put on glory. No more is one clothed with leaves and standing in shame, for they have found through our Lord the robe of the house of Adam, and the church purges her ears of the serpent's poison, which they heard and by which they were dulled. Now new and bright are those who had lost their garments. So we see here the church is paradise replanted. It's as simple as that. In short, Ephraim sees in the mirror of symbols that the story of recovering the knowledge of God doesn't end with Moses. Moses was, in fact, merely a parable or a paradigm, himself a type of the knowledge of God which is now available in the church. And all three elements, life and wisdom and transfiguration by glory, they all coalesce in the church in the baptismal and Eucharistic liturgy of the church, each and every day. And notice also that other feature that we've seen, the both the peril and the promise of divine knowledge and life confront each and every member of the assembly of the saints. So yeah, Moses' experience, the thing which Adam was to have had, it is available to us as well. It's available to us in the church's liturgy and in her sacraments each and every day. I want to turn now to the third uh, section of my talk, that question of whether God can be investigated. Because we've spent all of this time talking about how God's essence is incomprehensible, seeing this, these examples uh, coming straight out of, out of the Bible and explained by St. Ephraim. And it might seem uh, a little strange because aren't we aren't we investigating God? Isn't that what we're doing when we do theology? But um, Ephraim actually means something a little bit more specific, and so I want to try to explain that now. Now that we have seen the context, especially that liturgical context in which we, like Moses and Adam, can approach God with fear and love, can approach the perilous accessibility of the divine light, we can also with Ephraim reflect 
on how the dynamic of divine symbolism operates. And one of the interesting features that uh, we notice uh, when we read, especially Ephraim's descriptions of Adam and Moses, knowledge of God, is how he so frequently describes that experience in perceptual and even in tactile terms. Ephraim, for example, speaks of those who see God in paradise or in the church as, quote, nursing at the breast of wisdom, unquote. He describes them as, quote, becoming drunk on the waves of divine glory, unquote. And in another passage, he even speaks of opening the divine treasury to receive, quote, the heavenly drink that makes its drinkers wise, unquote. So you can see it's, it's very, very concrete, very tactile, very immediate terms that Ephraim wants to describe the kind of knowledge of God that God gives to us. And what is the significance of these very perceptual and tactile forms of encounter? Well, the descriptions of Adam and Moses and the liturgy of the church suggest for us, I, th I think pretty clearly, that knowing God is not, as far as Ephraim is concerned, an abstract affair at all, even though it does clearly involve the mind with its thoughts and its word, which of course distinguish uh, the human being from the animals as it was in the beginning. <clears throat> Consistently, when Ephraim discusses knowing God in a way that is authentic to our vocation to divine likeness, such knowledge is always together both sensuous and intellectual. And so too, therefore, are the symbols, or if you like, the concepts in which that knowledge is couched. They flow concretely through scripture, the natural world, and the church's sacramental and liturgical life. And even more to the point, something that's, that's particularly interesting is that Ephraim seems to think, seems at least he inclines to think that our only way to have knowledge of God is through perception mediated by symbols that we can actually sense. But to put it very simply, we need the senses in order to pursue God as wisdom. The eye of the mind for Ephraim functions in and through our physical eyes and through our bodies and the practices, the, the, the very physical practices and activities that we undertake. Just as the soul is not knowable or expressive apart from the senses, God, Ephraim suggests, is not knowable or expressive apart from physically perceivable symbols. He expresses this in um, the 44th hymn on, the, on faith. Who is able, Ephraim asks rhetorically, who is able to be adequate for the Lord of creatures, to investigate his essence, or to seek out his paternity, to touch his majesty, or to speak the manner of his existing. Behold, he is hidden from everything in everything. And except for the fact that he willed to explain himself, there would have been nothing in creation that could translate him for us. So Ephraim's laying down a principle here, and that is that we shouldn't expect God to be translatable in our own, into our own terms. The wonderful new thing is, though, that God did, in fact, translate himself for us, and he did it in the very act of creating. He made all that is perceivable into potential symbols or translators of himself. When he says, for instance, in him all things were created, when God created the world, he inscribed his possessions with his symbols. For when he created the world, he gazed upon it, and it was adorned with his icons. At the same time, the fact that created things mirror in some way the divine perfection, uh, divine perfections should not cause us to mistake them for God, because they're not God. And perhaps even more insidious, because that may be kind of obvious, right, not to mistake creatures for God, perhaps even more insidious is the idolatry or worship of our own concepts. And that would be, in Ephraim's words, an intellectual drunkenness that is not praiseworthy. Here's how he puts it. If a person were to be confused 
and focus his attention on the borrowed names of the divine majesty, he would blaspheme and slander it by those very borrowed characteristics that it puts on to help him. And it would defraud the graciousness that has bent down its height to his immaturity. For although he is not family to it, it has put on human likenesses that it might bring him to the likenesses of itself. And so Ephraim goes on, do not then let your intellect be confused by appellations for paradise has clothed itself in the names of your own kindred, not because it is impoverished did it put on your likenesses. Your nature is exceedingly weak, incapable of managing its majesty. And indeed, its beauties are actually quite faint because they have been depicted with weak pigments akin to you. So there's so much going on here in this, in this passage. I want to start first with the uh, interesting pun. Eph Ephraim's got lots of puns. That word for blaspheme that I've translated as blaspheme is actually the same root in, um, in Syriac, also in contemporary Arabic, actually, for being drunk. And so even though it means here to blaspheme, Ephraim's audience would automatically hear that play on words, that the blasphemer is like a drunk man. And Ephraim, Ephraim actually says this in different ways in other passages in his text as well. So that's that's um, uh, part of the, the dynamic in this text. But um, Ephraim here is warning us against taking the biblical depictions of the divine majesty and of paradise, literally. And in fact, as if to prove the point, he even deliberately conflates God and paradise. He describes the majesty of God in exactly the same terms as the majesty of paradise. Neither one can be exactly represented. And created metaphors in scripture there are truthful, but they are faint depictions of the glorious reality of God, which is more vibrant than our mind or imagination can grasp. So we can get we can get a depiction, yeah, but we have to recognize that it doesn't fully embody, does not encapsulate that, that the, the glory of what is experienced, because nothing can encapsulate the glory of God. Ephraim warns us against the intellectual and spiritual immaturity of Adam and Eve, who, because they partook of divine knowledge intemperately before the time, lost the beatitude that it confers. On the other hand, this passage is also a recognizable Ephraimian equivalent to the famous assertion of St. Athanasius that God became human in order to make humans God. Ephraim has merely phrased the point with greater precision than Athanasius did. The divine majesty put on our likenesses that we might put on his likenesses. So we can see right away that same theme that the knowledge of God divinizes. It makes us like God. And the mind's names and concepts need to be understood rightly or else, although they themselves, there's nothing wrong with them, uh, if we don't understand them rightly, they will fail in their task of conveying to us the knowledge of God. So if we are still left wondering how we might practice the knowledge of God in the right way, though, right? Because uh, so we've got this kind of admonition that we have to be careful uh, of, but um, that desire to know God and that desire to speak of him is still there, right? So in Ephraim's first discourse to Hypatius, he discusses this desire and he introduces an important nuance that helps us to understand how we ourselves ought to approach this mystery of the divine glory. This is the wonder, he says, that it is easy for us to perceive it. He's talking about the knowledge of God. Um, it is easy for us to perceive it, but very difficult to formulate an argument about it. But this is not only the case in this matter, so not just with knowledge of God, in other words, but rather everything is like this, for whatever exists can be debated, but it cannot be investigated. It is po possible to know that it exists, but to investigate how it exists is not possible. Observe that we are able to perceive everything, but can investigate nothing completely. We perceive great things, even as we are unable perfectly to investigate lowly things. 
So at first it looks like Ephraim is returning here to that theme that we saw earlier, the, the, um, that God exists versus how he exists. But notice the way in which he puts it. He's actually phrased it that we can perceive that God exists, but not investigate how. There's a difference, or maybe you could say an overflow, between what, it, what we can perceive of God and what we can conceive of him. Now, some scholars have taken Ephraim's uh, distinction between knowing that something is the case and knowing how it is the case uh, sim uh, to mean that simply that we can just know that God exists and that's it. For people who take that view, this also seems to conflate revealed knowledge, knowledge by faith, uh, with natural knowledge, knowledge by reason, because Ephraim speaks of them as directed at the same object, simply knowing that God exists. But that's actually, I think, a, a misreading of, of Ephraim, uh, particularly as this text from the first discourse to Hypatius makes clear, because what Ephraim's really saying is something about how the knowledge of God starts, how, how we uh, are able to begin knowing God. It begins he is telling us, in an act of intelligent sense perception, and not because God is physical in himself, of course, but because that is how we can begin to know him. He's making this distinction between perceiving and conceiving. You always perceive more than you can conceive, you see. And for Ephraim, all human knowledge begins, and in fact, it always persists, in the media of sensation. God simply makes himself available to our sense faculties in different ways. So in, when it comes to revealed knowledge, what he's doing is making himself available to us in new symbols in salvation history, the symbols that we find in scripture and in the sacraments of the church, in addition to the natural symbols that we find all around us. And maintaining that grounding in perception I would argue, is the key for Ephraim's account of how we maintain the proper balance and moderation in the quest for knowledge, the knowledge of God. So to put it very simply, we could say, don't let your concepts get ahead of what you perceive. It has to go the other way around, Ephraim is telling us. Whatever we can truly understand of God, such as it may be, and remember, it's always limited, whatever we understand of God must always be rooted in liturgy, in scripture, and in the reality of the cosmos. So this is a fitting place to conclude our talk this evening with the issue of the correct human response to God's gift of the knowledge of himself. We've already gotten several hints throughout all of the texts that we've seen. We know that God, whose essence is unsearchable, graciously makes himself available for, to us to be known and he adapts and moderates himself for our weakness. In the natural world, he does it. In scripture, he does it. And in the mysteries of the church, he does it. Like Adam was to have done, and Moses did in fact do, we ought to fast and discipline ourselves, not only in our desire for food, yes, that, of course, but there is also a fasting for the eyes, a need to discipline our desire for the knowledge of God. What kind of, does, what, what does that look like? I want to give you one example for Ephraim. What mouth, he says, what mouth, my son, is fit to explain or to speak before the gate of that hidden and silent treasury? The celestial watchers, when they fix their gaze on it, seal their mouths in the silence of discernment. And the watchers are the angels, by the way. This is the traditional Syriac term for the angels. That silence of discern discerning silence is what he's commending to us. But then he goes on to explain why. Whoever does not know the brightness of that place, and we should think back to si Moses on Sinai and Adam in paradise, that the brightness. Whoever does not know the brightness of that place babbles like a drunk, both he and those who listen to him. And if my son, he shakes off his pride on which he had been drunk, so it's not wine that we're talking about, we're talking about pride. What does he do? He keeps silent and glorifies. In other words, 
he goes to liturgy. In this case, we must abstain not from physical wine, or not only from that, perhaps, but from the pride that leads us to speak of God when we have not experienced the brightness of that place. You see, that's the, that's the problem. You don't have anything to speak about if you haven't actually experienced that. If we have not experienced the brightness of that place, if we, to put it in the words of David the psalmist, do not know the beauty of the divine house, then we've got nothing to talk about. But more positively, the experience of the beauty of the Lord's house involves imposing a kind of discerning measure on our senses. Here's how he puts that. Every human being, he says, in polishing his eye in this life, thus becomes capable of seeing the glory that is greater than all. So what Adam had, what Moses had, you can have that too. He goes on. Every human being, in opening his ear in this life, thus becomes sufficient for his wisdom. Every human being, in making himself a receptacle in this life, thus becomes able to hold a portion of his treasures. And the thing to realize about this, this sort of shaping of our senses to be receptive to the divine light, the thing to recognize is that we're actually just responding to, the, to God's own initiative in measuring himself out for us. In the very next stanza, Ephraim says, the Lord who is beyond measure. In other words, he cannot be measured. But in, in moderation, he nourishes all things. Because remember, the divine light is like food for us. The sight of him is adapted to our eye and his voice to our hearing, his blessing to our hunger, his wisdom to our tongue. In his gift, good things teem. Renewed in tastes and resplendent in fragrance, transformed in power and made joyful in colors. He's talking about the liturgy and he's talking actually specifically about the Eucharist in this passage. In fact, by measuring our perception and our thinking in this way, we're not doing God favors. It's important to point out God doesn't need us to do this for him, his sake. Rather, what we are doing, according to Ephraim, is recovering the stature of our original dignity, recovering the dignity of Adam, moving from a state of foolishness to a state of wisdom. The fool, Ephraim says, who is unwilling to perceive his own dignity has become content to be an animal rather than a human. An animal serves only its desires blamelessly. But if there had been implanted in animals the least perception of intelligence, perhaps then the wild asses would have wept for not being human. You see, we have, according to Ephraim, this tremendous gift, the ability to perceive the divine glory. The problem was that Adam and Eve had served their own desire, their desire for knowledge, right? And if you go back and you read Genesis, that's exactly what tempted Eve. But they did it without truly perceiving their own dignity as free and rational. So for us, instead, to follow Moses to the mountain of transfiguration is not only to know God in all his glory, but it is also to know ourselves who were created for that very glory. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for that. That was a, uh, an absolutely fascinating talk. And um, it was much, it was a much needed to corrective to our overemphasis on the West in this truth and tradition lectures, lecture series. Um, a, a little thing. Can you, uh, can we? Can you stop screen sharing? Sure. I just wanted to mention that uh, for those who may come back to visit this uh, uh, this video, there's a brief uh, bibliography here at the end. Uh, feel free to consult that at your leisure. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, wonderful talk, Dr. Hayes. Um, well, so those of you, if you have questions, feel free to, to, to type them in, whether you're on Zoom, you can do it in the, in the Q&A box, or you can put them into, into Facebook or, or YouTube, uh, however you wish. Um, so, Dr. Hayes, first of all, let's start off with, a, uh, well, um, let's start off with a general question. So, 
obviously you are, for, for those of you, for those here who are not acquainted with your work, you are our specialist on the Eastern Fathers. St. Ephraim is your specialty, but you're quite versed in many of the, many Eastern Fathers. What readings would you recommend uh, to our viewers to deepen their knowledge of the Eastern Fathers? And, and if you could maybe, let's tie a second question in is, you know, why are the Eastern Fathers important today? Obviously, we've had this conversation several times about the recovery of the Eastern Fathers was a real, was a, quite a, a major, uh, a, a major development in Western theology in the 20th century, right? And these questions of what do the Eastern Fathers mean and how are they to be interpreted? But what do you, you know, what do they mean? Why are they important? And, and how would you recommend uh, people begin to, to kind of chip away at their thoughts? Well, there's, there's quite a lot to say about this. Um, obviously, one goal of tonight's lecture on Ephraim was to give some sense of the importance of, of, of Ephraim's contributions. Uh, but a lot could be said, uh, a lot of what I said about Ephraim would apply to many of the other fathers of the fourth century, especially people like uh, St. Gregory Nazianzen, who also uses Moses as an example in, in theological thinking in, various, in a very similar way in his um, uh, theological orations, right, which are his great, great classic works of Trinitarian theology. Uh, you also have very similar, uh, a very similar understanding of the knowledge of God in St. Gregory of Nyssa, also from the fourth century. He, Gregory of Nyssa is the younger brother of St. Basil. So what, what I think the, the great value of reading the fathers is to start to realize um, <clears throat> the Eastern fathers in particular, once you start to put them together, is to, to notice their strong similarities and how they are um, independently and, and, and sometimes also dependently <clears throat> witnessing to the, the, tr the full tradition of the church. So um, let's, I'll, I'll say something in just a moment about the broader importance of the Eastern Fathers, but let's just start with that question of how to read, or like what to read. <laughs> I would say start with the fourth century, because um, th there's, there's a, the, the fourth century is a really important point in the history of the church for many different reasons, but one reason that makes it particularly of interest to those who want to get into the early church is that we simply have a lot more material from the fourth century because this is when the persecutions ended and the church was able to come out of the shadows. And so we have a sort of flowering of literature from the early church in this time. And this means that there's quite a lot of, of things that uh, are available in accessible translations. Um, there are a few translations listed on the uh, bibliography that I gave at the end of the lecture, uh, translations of St. Ephraim. Um, but I would, uh, there, there's also a couple of really good anthologies. Um, let's see, uh, one put together by Jean Danielou called From Glory to Glory, uh, which is on Gregory of Nyssa's mystical writings. That's a real treat. There's a wonderful anthology, very short, that was put together by Hans Urs von Balthasar. It's called The Scandal of the Incarnation. And that's an anthology of texts from Irenaeus. And I really, um, I, you, you, you wouldn't wanna rely on these anthologies for your, the entirety of your encounter with the Eastern Fathers, but they're definitely a great place to begin because what you, you get the benefit of other scholars sort of picking out the juiciest and most interesting bits. And it, they're relatively digestible and they're in sort of small chunks. So for people who don't have a whole lot of time, I recommend some of these anthologies, um, uh, like like from Glory to Glory and um, and the um, um, the one from Irenaeus. Uh, it's worth pointing out, by the way, we started our lecture series with Saint Irenaeus. Irenaeus is famous for having said um, something very similar to Saint Ephraim. Uh, he put it very simply: um, the glory of God is is man fully alive, but the life of man is the vision of God. And so even, even just a few generations removed from the apostles, we have the, the fathers of the church insisting upon this sapiential character of human existence, right? That man is made to know God. So uh, my, actually my introduction to the fathers was through that von Balthasar anthology of Irenaeus. And I, I still think it's a great way to, for people to get interested. But why should we care? Why, why are the Eastern fathers important? Well, um, uh, and the eminent theologian uh, Khaled Anatolios uh, wrote a brief piece commenting on the uh, decree of the Second Vatican Council, Orientalium Ecclesiarum, which is the decree on the Eastern churches. And he points out that 
over time, there's gradually become there's gradually come to be a greater emphasis in the papal magisterium on the importance of the East. Uh, and the reason for that is made clear in Orientalium Ecclesiarum that um, the the Eastern churches have their own um, sort of distinctive share of the of the great tradition of the church, right? Of the great of the stream of divine revelation, their own distinctive angle on it, and we would not, um, uh, if we're truly lovers of uh, of the divine mysteries, lovers of wisdom, if we truly want to understand our theology, then why would we deprive ourselves of of this uh, of this unique take on on uh, the mysteries of the church? I think for a lot of Western Catholics, it, there's also this advantage that uh, the Eastern fathers are just new and fresh, you know, they're different. And so that by presenting some things that are familiar, but in a new light, you can come to a deeper appreciation of them. So um, I think we've got, uh, uh, you know, strong institutional sense on the part of the Western church that the Eastern fathers uh, and the Eastern tradition more generally need to be recovered. And then I think we can just sort of intuitively understand that if you really wanna go deep in the tradition, go deep in the whole tradition, and don't don't skip the don't skip the Greeks, but don't skip the the Syriac fathers easy, either. And the wonderful thing about that is that more and more the Syriac fathers are are more available in English translations. So it it's becoming easier to get access to some of these texts. Um, particularly um, the hymns on paradise, for example, are available from Saint Vladimir Seminary Press in a wonderful translation. So if you wanted to read Ephraim specifically, read that one. You won't be sorry. Um, I read it every, I read it all the time. It's, it's, series, it's a wonderful it's a classic. The series from St. Vladimir's. Isn't that a, yeah. such a fantastic little series? It, it is, it's really a great gift to the church. I mean, it, you know, and those introductions are almost <laughs> worth the price themselves, especially uh, for the neophyte or, or the scholar alike. I mean, there's, it, there's a really kind of a rich breadth there. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me let me ask you about this. What about the document? I was just thinking of this as you were talking. I mean, you, you I'm, I'm sure, I imagine you've read the Congregation for Catholic Education. Of course, this is the uh, the Roman Congregation. The instruction on the study of the Fathers of the Church in the formation of priests. Have, have you ever come across that document? Um, this is not Optatum Totius, is it? This is something else. This is something else, and it's newer. Oh, okay. It's actually oh. newer. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, my my nose is usually buried in the text of the fourth century, so I think I may have missed this particular one. Uh, I'm not sure that I've read it. We could, I, I actually read it when I, I taught as a, you know, uh, I taught patristics at, at a seminary, and uh, we, I actually had the guys read it, and, it was, and we'll, we'll post it in the, on the Facebook thread. Um, okay, let me get to another one here. So th there was a lot of really interesting questions. Um, uh, in your research, do you think St. Ephraim believes that the incarnation would happen even without the fall? If man is created to know God, how can we know him without the Son crossing the infinite chasm between God and man? Really good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, um, that of course, um, that question can be translated into terms of the debate between Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. Uh, because they they uh, they took opposing views of this uh, in answer to this question, uh, I think that um, Saint Ephraim doesn't, to my knowledge, ever say anything explicitly about this, but uh, he probably inclines to the to that view that um, the incarnation would have would have taken place even apart from the fall. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that it's a particularly useful question. Ephraim himself might have uh, might have labeled it under the heading of investigation and said, you know, we shouldn't bother with this. So <laughs> I I myself um, I'm not quite sure what he would say. Probably though, like many of the Eastern fathers, I think uh, inclines more to the idea that the incarnation was um, was was Plan A. You know. Um, uh, there is actually a scholar who wrote a little bit about something like this. In later Syriac tradition, uh, there was a debate on whether Adam was created mortal or immortal. And it has to do with, um, with a little bit of ambiguity, actually, in Ephraim's own reading of, of the story. Uh, so some people took it one way and others took it another. Ephraim seems pretty clearly, though, if you read him carefully, to say that, that the answer is he was not created 
uh, mortal, nor was he created immortal. He was in this in-between state and he would get either mortality or immortality based on what he, uh, on the action of his free will. So Ephraim usually defies categorization. So I'm not sure I would call him a scotist, uh, you know, I, but um, insofar as he inclines in that direction, it may be, he would be a fellow traveler. Yeah. Well, you know, that's really interesting because this ties in also, you know, with, with you're saying he might lump that question, you know, under in investigations that maybe shouldn't be pursued. I mean, this ties in what you were saying earlier on this mortification of even feel a certain, you know, desire for maybe excessive theological knowledge, if I could say that. And you know, as you were talking about that, I, I was thinking about, you mentioned earlier, St. Gregory of Nazianzus's uh, five orations, and especially the early oration where he has some of the biblical imagery and he, he draws on this notion of humility in kind of ch in chastening the uh, eunomians and their desire to kind of plumb all of the depths, even excessively so, of mm -hmm. the uh, of the, 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 the mystery of the Trinity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that it's um, I, I there's actually a dissertation that's been written comparing Ephraim's uh, arguments with those of Gregory Nazianzen. Uh, so people have noticed the similarities and have, uh, so we've actually got a whole book on the subject. Uh, I've only read parts of the book because it's kind of difficult to get a hold of, but, um, but yeah, it's, I, I think there's a profound similarity in this particular uh, aspect of, of emphasizing the humility, uh, necessary for theology. And I think actually this is something shared, not just by the fourth century fathers, uh, in their disputes with the Eunomians and others. Uh, but I think it's shared also by um, John Henry Newman. Um, in, if you read his book on the fourth century, which is called Arians of the Fourth Century, he picked up on this theme and he noticed that all the Orthodox fathers emphasize uh, something like this aspect in their, in their teaching. So it's, it's actually a common thread in the, in the entirety of the fourth century. I, you know, I think the, the problem as Ephraim saw it, is that we have to ground theology in um, the, in its proper sources. Because if we simply make it an exercise, an abstract exercise in, uh, you know, sort of uh, logic puzzles or uh, tricky God problems, as one of my theology professors in grad school once put it, then then we're doing it wrong, right? It's, it, this is, theology is not tricky God problems. It's, it's, um, <laughs> there might be some tricky problems, uh, but that's that's not what this is about. It's about uh, the encounter with God, which ultimately should be transformative. So if we lose sight of that, then we've kind of lost our way. And and I think that that's a salutary um, uh, message for any age, and but also particularly uh, for us now with with the the problems, the lingering problems of rationalism that we that we face. Um, well, that leads me to a next question. So this that was a good segue. Um, <coughs> Well, no, and this might be okay. This this might not be a tricky God qu problem, but I imagine you know uh, I, I'm guessing that this is going to be a tricky historical problem. What kind of influence? What kind of influence uh, can we find? I mean, obviously, as you're talking, it's hard not to. I mean, assuming obviously that the dating for pseudo Dionysius is late fourth century, fifth century, or something like that, and it's hard not to see some echoes there. I mean. Is, is what, yeah. what kind of influence did Ephraim have on the tradition, especially the Eastern tradition? Do we know that? Yeah, it's it's a little hard to be sure, um, and there's some interesting historical reasons for that. Um, one reason was that Ephraim. Um, well, one reason has to do with the Christological controversies. So Ephraim's works, uh, um, sort of uh, the, the emphasis on them shifted gear from there from the dogmatic questions to more spirituality and and questions like that and also Ephraim's works are kind of uh, surrounded by this thicket if you will of uh, pseudonymous uh, compositions he was so popular that a lot of works were attributed to him falsely and a lot of the works that survive in Greek as far as we know they haven't been much studied so we have to say with a certain amount of humility we're not entirely sure but there's a lot of things there that probably are not by Ephraim, and the number of pseudonymous works attributed to St. Ephraim is second only to the number of pseudonymous works attributed to St. John Chrysostom. So it's it's a huge amount. So the Ephraim, the question of Ephraim's influence on the later tradition is sort of um, uh, complicated by these factors, but 
the Pseudodionysius point is a really important one because uh, you're not the first person to bring this up. In fact, Sebastian Brock, the eminent Syriac scholar, writes in, um, I think it's in his book, The Luminous Eye, about the similarities between Ephraim and Pseudodionysius. And, and I think that that's a very spot on intuition. I think there's a lot of similarity uh, between Ephraim and Pseudodionysius. And so I would say that to the, right now in the current state of our research, at least as far as I'm aware, the places where we're most confident we could say there's, there's influence on subsequent tradition would be in um, uh, uh, Pseudodionysius as kind of a reflection of a lot of Ephraim's ideas which are really those of this, the Syrian tradition. And of course, Pseudo-Dionysius has this huge influence on the rest of the church. He's commented on by Maximus the Confessor in the East. He's commented on by just about every medieval in the West. Um, everybody read him. He just tr tremendously influential uh, on people like St. Albert the Great and St. Thomas Aquinas as well. So, um, and, and particularly we're thinking of things like the theology of names. Ephraim's got a really developed theology of names that is recognizably parallel to, similar to the thought of Pseudo-Dionysius. The other place I would say that Ephraim had this profound influence was uh, something I mentioned in the talk, which is his influence on the liturgical tradition, both in the Syriac and the Greek. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we follow the, the principle lex orandi, lex credendi, uh, the church believes as she prays. So really, Ephraim, he's a liturgical composer as far as we can, as best we can understand. And his, um, his works were influential on the, the Byzantine tradition, especially through St. Romanos the Melodist, who was a Syriac speaking father, although all of his hymnography is composed in, in Greek. So, so I think we, we can point to those two avenues as very likely, even if we, even if we can't draw a straight line um, it's, it's to show like specific textual forms of dependence uh, between Ephraim and the rest of the, of the tradition. When it comes to sort of dogmatic Trinitarian or Christological questions, probably not so much. But honestly, I think that Ephraim's great gift to the church uh, and, and that of many of the Syriac fathers is in the realm of spirituality. And so if those scholars who study spirituality and those people who live it, even better, um, will they'll be the ones who will discover more and more of this this influence. Ephraim himself is uh, Ephraim studies are experiencing something of a renaissance because his works have, are finally available. For a long time, they were um, uh, not really easily accessible in in good editions and not really accessible in good translations, and that's starting to change. And so. Um, it's also worth pointing out here, by the way, for those who are, are interested in these sorts of things, Ephraim is among the doctors of the church. He was named a doctor of the church by Pope Benedict the Fifteenth in the bull Principia Apostolorum Petro. So, uh, but that was a fairly recent development, and it was in part because of the the growing uh, prominence of his writings that that happened. Mm -hmm. So, it's uh, th there's w w time will tell. I'm sure we will uncover more, but for now. Uh, I would say the the hymnotic tradition and the and the theology of divine names are two very likely places where we'll see the stamp of Ephraimian ideas. That's fascinating. And and is were Greek versions of of Ephraim's text included in Means Patrologia? Oh, uh, hmm. I, you know, I'm actually not sure if any of the Greek Ephraim is in there. The, the Greek Ephraim, the, the, the edition that I'm most familiar with is actually hard to come by. It's like about, I think it's like eight volumes, seven or eight volumes published in Thessaloniki. Um, it, um, I'm, I'm not sure if, if the uh, Patrologia Greca actually includes any of the Ephraim Grecus. If it does, the chances of it being authentic are kind of dicey, right? So the, the, now one of the interesting things though is that in the 18th century, uh, Maronite scholars with the patronage of the Pope of Rome actually did a lot of the groundwork to bring Syriac manuscripts from the East uh, to the Vatican Library and to produce an edition of Ephraim. So the Editio Romana, the old Roman edition uh, in the 18th century was in fact the first uh, real chance that scholars had to get to kind of who are not of the of the Syriac tradition itself to get a kind of taste of, of Ephraim's works. Now, the, the quality of those editions is somewhat lacking, but it was a first try, right? So, it, you know, it's always the way. So this leads me to think that if there was some Ephraim in the Patrologia Greca, it probably wasn't uh, much because um, um, the um, 
because they actually had to produce a volume of the Greek Ephraim in the Aditya Romana, or maybe it's a couple volumes, actually, I forget how many. Okay, fantastic. Dr. Hayes, do you have time for one more question? Yep. Shoot. So, uh, okay, this is a, uh, let's see, um, you mentioned it when you were discussing the wisdom of Adam, um, that he, there's a certain parallel with the Jewish interpretation of this notion of Adam being clothed in wisdom, the, this wisdom of God. Is, was, mm -hmm. is he getting this from direct Jewish sources, or is this just simply kind of coincidental parallel? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's hard to, for me to be sure. Uh, somebody else might be uh, more certain of this. There's, there's no question that Ephraim was directly aware of, of Jewish traditions and because they're just all over his writings. And a lot of scholarship has been done on this. There's a, an article in French on um, the hymns on paradise and the Jewish traditions that are contained in there. Yeah. Uh, it's been a little while since I actually looked at it, so I can't be uh, too specific. But um, Sebastian Brock's got an article on Jewish traditions and Syriac sources. The, the, the Syriac tradition generally is filled with, with um, uh, knowledge of the Jewish traditions. Actually, for those who are interested, the best probably the best accessible account of this is um, the classic book by Robert Murray, Symbols of Church and Kingdom, which is on the, the ecclesiology of the early Syriac tradition. And it goes through a lot of, um, a lot of, it tries to go through the, the, find the sources of the traditions. And some of these actually go back to other Near Eastern sources as well, not just Jewish. So uh, it's really a rich field, but um I, I don't think it makes sense, given all that scholarship on this question, I don't think it really makes sense to speak of a uh, accidental parallels. I think Ephraim knows the Jewish sources. And, and even the Peshitta itself, which is the Syriac version of the Old Testament, um, this is translated directly from the Hebrew. And Ephraim himself shows some knowledge of, of a little Hebrew. And so there, there's all these, these features that suggest a pretty intimate acquaintance with, um, with with Jewish tradition more so than in other fathers, and honestly, I think that's what makes him him particularly interesting. His exegeses of Noah are are, are particularly marked by Jewish tradition. There's all, there's another book actually um, by a scholar named Kronholm, which I've looked at, but I don't own a copy of because hard to, again hard to get a hold of. Um, but it's all about Jewish traditions in Ephraim's exegesis of the first uh, several chapters of Genesis. So. Um, I, these are th these are all evidence of very deep acquaintance with things. In my talk, I was simply referring to the idea of Adam clothed and being clothed in glory, right. um, and and for that, there's scholars like Andre Orloff and Alexander Galitzin who've written a lot about um, about those parallels. We see some of this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, actually. Uh, so that, that's one source that we can go to to find uh, uh, similarities between Ephraim and um, and Jewish sources. Yeah. Well, that, that's absolutely fascinating, uh, and it, it, this is a great um, th this is a great recap to say if you're interested in really digging into the tradition and doing the Eastern Fathers, then USC is a great place because uh, I know I enjoy immensely my conversations with Dr. Hayes. He's such an authority on uh, all aspects. Seemingly, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the second century. We, we've talked about the Quran. He's really a, a wealth of knowledge about all of this. Dr. Hayes, it's really been wonderful to have you on. Thank you so much for my, 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 my camera keeps. Uh, it's, it's really been fantastic to have you on. Thank you so much for giving up your time during your, a very busy summer to uh, help out with the, with the lecture series. It, it was my delight. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, thank you to all those who, are, who attended. Absolutely. And this, of course, this, this, I'm, I'm grateful that we have uh, now this video will be up on YouTube. We have a good St. Ephraim introduction uh, that'll be up there. Uh, and as I said earlier, next week is Sister Albert Marie Sermansky, Dominican, on Albert the Great and Eucharistic Beauty. And then we'll be finishing up with John Henry Newman, Dr. Uh, Dominic Aquila. So, uh, Dr. Hayes, it's been a pleasure. Have a great summer. I'm sure I will talk to you soon. And uh, everybody else, we will see you next Wednesday. Thanks so much. Good evening.